you join me today at the wheel of something of a motoring icon. This is a 1967 Batoni styled Fiat Dino 2 litre V6. Oh, what a car. Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. There aren't many cars which exist purely to give a home to an engine because the factory, the company, needed to put that engine into something. Sure, there are designs that have been heavily influenced by the shape of the engine. The Austin Allegro, for example, was designed to be quite svelte and good looking until the designers were handed a great big lump of an engine which didn't fit in a svelte good looking car. Morris Minor, that was designed to take a flat four. That's why it's so wide and squat at the front. And then there's this, the Fiat Dino. What a car. This car purely exists because of what's underneath the bonnet. Let's start there today. So, prepare to be dazzled. Okay, there's an awful lot of air cleaner here, hiding what is quite a special motor. It goes forward a really long way. This is the Fiat slash Ferrari 2 litre V6. Well, the reason this engine exists is because back in the early 60s, there was a change in the FIA regulations, and so Ferrari wanted a sub two litre V6, and this is the engine they wanted. It's unusually a 65 rather than a 60 degree V in the, in the block. Now, the problem was, in order to homologate it, they needed 500 engines built every 12 months. And with their production levels, that just wasn't going to happen. So Ferrari needed a business partner. They needed to work with a bigger company who can produce the engine and use it in something else. So they spoke to Fiat, and Fiat were excited by the idea. So the job of converting the racing V6 into a road-going V6 went to Aurelia Lampredi, one of the legends of engine design. So he redesigned the engine for road use. Now, it didn't go exactly as Enzo had planned, because he had wanted to keep production in-house at Maranello to keep his own Ferrari. Ferrari engines built in Ferrari and the Fiat engines they could kind of do what they wanted as long as they made enough numbers but Fiat management and they were the bigger boys in this they thought otherwise they didn't want to risk any production interruptions they didn't want to risk any kind of regularity of the flow because they're a proper production line so they brought the engine production in-house to Turin so all these V6 engines whether they're going to the Fiat or to the Ferrari destination came down the same line and the engine workers didn't know what they were working on at the time. So the cam covers and indeed the boot lid of this car bear the Dino logo. Dino, of course, being the name of Ferrari's sadly lost son and the name that was used for their racing engines. And conversely, in the Ferrari applications, there is Fiat somewhere in the casting. Now the engine is a bit of a masterpiece. It's an all alloy block with cast iron liners. It's a quad cam engine, so double overhead cam on each uh, bank of cylinders. Alloy heads with cast iron valve seats, hemispherical combustion chambers, so basically it's a Hemi engine if you're American. And sitting on top of the 1987cc block are triple Webers, Weber 40s. So the whole thing is chucking out about 158 horsepower, although Ferrari were labelling their engines as 180. Although apparently they came down to a uh, misunderstanding about whether they were using SAE or DIN figures. When they went to the Mark II facelift in 1969, it became a 2.4 litre engine and also became the first production car to get electronic ignition. Although this does appear to have something that looks a bit like electronic ignition on the sill here. Well, looking around the outside of the car, it's fair to say it didn't get too many whacks with the ugly stick. And it might even go as far as to say it's actually quite nice looking. Maybe even a bit more than that, perhaps. Now looking around these beautiful sweeps and curves of this body and the way this coupe window kind of opens up from a point back here, expands out to the front of the car. It's just absolutely stunning Italian design. You can see maybe where it's influenced other later cars. I mean, looking from that rear three quarter angle, you can sort of see the haunches of the, uh, the big Aston Vantage from the 70s. Look at this little corner here where the window comes into a point. You can sort of see hints of the Datsun Z cars and the Ford Capri. Now the reason this car is so beautiful and elegant is down to this badge on the sign. Design di Bertone. It was designed by Gigiaro at Bertone. Now this is where things get a bit weird in the story because obviously Fiat had to design their own car to put this V6 engine into because Ferrari is in their own car, the 206 and the 246, uh, which we all know. And in fact, that's probably my favorite Ferrari. And of course it wasn't uncommon at the time for Italian companies to go out to coach builders like Bertone to design their cars and even build the bodies if it's a low volume car and then bring it in house for assembly with the uh, running gear interior, that kind of stuff back in the main factory. However, when they revealed this car at the Turin Motor Show in 1966, it was the Spider version, which was designed by Pininfarina. And then in 1967, when they revealed this car, this being a 1967 car, 
it was designed by Bertone. And neither company had anything to do with the other one, and neither car looks much like the other one either. I don't know. However, I think I will say that this, the coupe, is the better looking one. I mean, just look at it, not just these beautiful, elegant curves down the side of the car. Look at this snarling, angry face, this big grill, this beautiful bumper wrapping around up into this long bonnet with little creases giving sort of strength and design interest. And it's clap hand wipers. I've no idea what the Triangle of Doom is like on there, Ian. I've been asked to keep it as clean as possible, so I don't think we'll be finding out today either. And it rolls round into the back of the car and this nice kind of clamshell actually giving quite a useful boot here in the back. And of course, under the bumper here at the back, these twin exhausts and the noise they make is just fabulous. Now this interior is delicious. It is absolutely fantastic. You climb in and you've got these lovely bucket seats that just grab you and hold you. This big wheel is so 1960s Italian sports car. It's almost like a cliche of itself. And the dashboard is just astonishing. And all this crafted leather pulled into these tight, tight shapes. Oh, let's have a walk around and tell you what we've got. Over on the door, there's almost nothing. It's just almost completely plain. There's just padded black vinyl, a door pull, and the door handle kind of hidden into this recess in the armrest. Also black padded, a bit of black carpet at the bottom. And because there's electric windows, there's no annoying handle in the way. So that's fine. Just a little turny dial to let you open your quarter light here in the front of the door. This car though has got quite a clever little addition down here in the door where you might think it's a blanking plate for a turny window. It's actually a 12 volt socket that someone's added, I think in both doors. That's quite a clever little addition. So yeah, not much going on on the doors. And you are kind of wrapped in and you feel a little bit tight on the arms because of the shape of the door, but your arms are straight out, a typical Italian driving position, long leaning back, not really bending your elbows too much anyway. Then you've got the dials in front of you and they're all separate little pod areas of little dials, independent dials on this lovely kind of light blonde wood. Uh, aqua olio on the far left, oil and water obviously. Your rev counter going up to 7,000 RPM, redlining at eight into 9,000 RPM. Oil pressure in the center, it's a little pod. Then the speedo going up to 250 kilometers an hour. The last time I went 250 kilometers an hour was about a week ago, actually, at Goodwood. If you haven't seen the Audi uh, Quattro video, take a look at that. That was lots of fun. And finally, on the right-hand side, we've got two more little dials, a little tiny clock, and the Benzina, your petrol gauge. And over on the far side of the dashboard, you've got kind of a mirror, three-part wood uh, concave area, which mirrors the shape of the uh, instruments in front of the driver, in front of the passenger. But in front of the passenger, you've got a big Bertone logo in the center of it. And underneath that, you have a big chrome button to open a very small glove box. Up top it's more softly padded leather and these typically very Italian round air vents, four of them blowing up into the windscreen. I'm not sure how good they actually are, but they look beautiful. In terms of T-shelf, there's very little going on up here. You'd only be able to get small espresso cups along the top, though you wouldn't really want to be putting anything hot on this lovely leather. The wheel, as I mentioned, is big, it's really big. A little thin-rimmed leather wheel feels very sort of funny in your hands after the chunky wheels we have today to be holding such a thin-rimmed wheel. It does feel nice with the leather though, and these three spokes with the kind of louvers are very hot rodish. And there are just two very thin stalks hidden behind the wheel, one for indicators, one I think for lights. And your wipers are this rocker switch toggled down here under the speedo. In the center of the wheel, we've got our horn. Beautiful twin tone, uh, Italian as it comes horn. That could be straight from the Italian job in a traffic jam. Oh, I noticed there is a horn switch down here. Look on my Mercedes W123. Flick that over. So I'm wondering, there's got town and country horn. Hang on. Yeah, it's got town and country horn. Oh, I love a town and country horn. Almost no cars have that anymore. And the idea being that when you're in the city, you don't need a big road clearing thing. You just need a little kind of poppy horn just to let people know you're there. In the country, when you're flying along down the open road, you want something big and powerful going off into the distance. Now, what else have we got? Here, under this kind of centre section of this point, almost like the grill of a Pontiac, uh, we've got one little rocker switch in the centre, which is unlabeled, so I have no clue what it does. I'm guessing something to do with heating and ventilation, because these five 
other little rockers which are kind of cast into the center section here are all for the heating and ventilation. Underneath we've got more of this lovely light colored wood with various pictograms for lights, interior lights, heated rear window, the two-tone horn, that kind of thing, and a couple of other unmarked little dials up here in the top. Below that is a blanking plate because there are only three options on the Fiat Dino. One was for metallic paint, which this car has. One was for leather seats, which we don't have. We've got this very soft vinyl. And the third was for a radio. We've just got a blanking plate with a Bertoni logo instead. And moving back here into this semi T-shelf area here around the gear shift, we've got front electric windows, left and right obviously, the five-speed all synchro mesh gearbox, which is an absolute delight to use. Then we've got a big handbrake, which is such a big long thing, they've actually had to recess this square box area here in order to put the handbrake on. Go back to a 12 volt socket and a little ashtray. And behind it, there's even a practical little cubby hole in the back of the console, so it's quite a useful car to be in. The back seats are two big, comfortable bucket seats. Accessing them is by the tiniest little lever you've ever seen on the side of a seat and the whole back seat falls down. There are seat belts in the rear and there are speakers in the rear and it's quite nice and airy with all the glass around you as well. Now they did like to hide their access pulls away. To get into the bonnet you have to open the glove box and pull the toggle inside there. To open the boot you have to open the door and there's a lockable switch to open the trunk. Now here in the boot it's actually not a bad size. It's not very deep at all because the spare wheel is under the carpet. It goes back a really, really long way and I can barely sit. What you can see are the two strut tops because there are two suspension shock absorbers on each wheel in the back. And you can see both the top nuts of them there. You can fit an awful lot of luggage in here and the seats do fold down as well. And I know the last owner did take some on an awful lot of road trips so he's used it extensively. So we can attest it is a practical, usable, everyday supercar. Now, the engine starts very easily. To that you can hear the four cams, the quad cams is singing when you blip the throttle. The engine was quite warm when I parked up, I've been there about an hour or so, it's all kind of cooled down a little more. Oh, it's got static seat belts, so you need to be uh, getting them right before you set off. Oh. Everyone loves a static seat belt, right? I had to fold this front seat forward so you can see over it, otherwise you wouldn't have a view of nothing. There we go. Look at that triangle of doom, it's massive. It's also quite a lot of unswept area at the bottom and sides of the screen as well, so interesting. Now, I've got to try and keep this car clean, which is not good, as it did rain for a second then, and there are puddles everywhere. I'm not sure how small the lane to my left is, so I'm going to find out, because the other lanes in every other direction are tiny. Oh, that noise is just amazing! Delicious. Now one problem I have got is it's left hand drive and quite wide for a 60s car. So uh, I do have to be a little bit cautious on these small country lanes. Now they say the gear shift is amazing. Lovely all synchro five speed there. Fifth is a bit of a trick to get because Fifth is a bit of a trick because you have to push over to the right and back again, but not quite all the way to the right. It's a lovely stiff shell of a car because it's all steel unibody construction. Although on the convertible, the Spider, it was actually, uh, I think, an aluminium boot and possibly bonnet as well. Stopping the car is easy, thanks to discs all round and dual circuit brakes as well. They were taking all eventualities in hand. They didn't want anyone coming a cropper in this thing because it was going to be driven hard and fast.
But interestingly, the suspension isn't that advanced. Although it's got independent coil springs at the front, in the rear, although it's got those two shock absorbers I mentioned, shock absorber, I can't say shock absorber, it's only got lift springs on the solid rear axle. Surprisingly basic. This car is currently for sale at Percival Motors near Maystone in Kent. Check out his website in the description below to see this and more incredible classics for sale there. Now visibility is amazing because the glass house on this car is absolutely massive. You can see all the way around, but the mirrors are pretty tiny and quite hard to see anything out of at all. So uh, just focus on what's in front and hope nothing is going to overtake because it's a rapid car. And 0 to 60 was eight and a bit seconds, which is fast, very fast back in the 60s. Obviously not so good these days, but you know, time moves on. And it, it's more about the experience, just hearing and feeling the noise of the engine, the grunt grunt from that V6. Ah, oh, so many big cars coming down this tiny lane. You do feel like the rear view mirror is almost touching your head most of the time. It's always very close to you, but you can see quite well out of it. There's no power steering, so parking speeds and maneuvering is very heavy indeed. But once you're on the move, it's perfectly kind of connected. You feel like you're part of the car. And the last owner of this car was, I think fastidious is probably the only word to describe it. He was an enthusiastic driver who loved using the car and enjoying it as it should be used, which is fast. And to that end, he wanted his car to be perfect. So anything at all that was wrong with it, he had it taken to an expert and sorted out immediately. I believe it's got four new camshafts in it, all correct spec, no, no kind of upgrading or changing or anything. This is exactly how one of these engines should feel, and it feels good. The noise of the revs rising is just addictive sounds so good. The chassis, the car, body feels stiff on this kind of bumpy little back road, but the suspension is soft enough to give you quite a nice ride actually. It's not bone shaking at all, it's, it's comfortable. This is a real GT car that you can go a long way in. Now there are those who actually prefer the look of this car over the um, over the Ferrari that also got this engine, which was a massively different vehicle, you know. This is front engine, that was mid-engined. This is a four-seater GT, that was a two-seater strictly. Oh, as you pull away, all those camshafts working together, it's a symphony. It's a beautiful noise. It's funny, the Ferrari Dino is actually one of my all-time favorites. It is my actual all-time favorite Ferrari. I think it's much has become my favourite Fiat. This road is not my favourite road though, this is awful. I'm sorry Simon, I promise to keep the car clean, it's filthy after this short run. There are cars that ought to be on your cars to drive list. And if this isn't on your list, it probably should be because this really is very nice indeed. I mean, this is a contemporary of, say, an Aston Martin. And although it's, well, it's 60,000 pounds, isn't, isn't cheap, but it drives way better than the Aston. And I'm gonna say looks definitely as good. get tired of that. 
you know, I don't have a problem with electrifying classic cars if it means you can keep the car on the road. But I would really miss a noise like that in a classic car. What a noise. What a beautiful sound. And what a great drive. Oh, I love this car. You know, rare as well, there's less than 4,000 coupes built. And this is a two litre engine. Many people think it's the sweeter of the two. The 2.4 might be more powerful, but this is the nicer engine to drive. Oh, I'm nearly back. One last blast. What a shame, I don't want to give this car back. Thank you for watching, I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this beautiful little kind of junior supercar really. I've, had, I've loved just being behind the wheel of this thing. I would happily take it anywhere across the continent right now and I wish I could. If you enjoyed this, please hit like and subscribe as always. Smash those subscribe button, the like button, all the usual stuff. I'll see you again next time driving something completely different.